I was in London the other day, looking through some old film magazines, and this article leapt out at me. Meet the new Errol Flynn. It was Roger Moore in 1961 talking about his new film, Gold of the Seven Saints, and I thought, how prescient. It might have been hype, but it was hype that in hindsight had a lot of truth to it. As I say, this was 1961, so the first James Bond film, Dr. No, hadn't been released yet. A world without Bond films, can you imagine? However, for most of the 1970s and half of the 1980s, Moore was arguably the preeminent screen action hero. And then I thought back to his knitting pattern. When I was a kid, before youngsters in sweatshops in the developing world made clothes as cheap as they are today, my mother used to knit sweaters for me. You could say it was a hobby and a money-saving exercise all rolled into one as she'd sit in an armchair, watching television, with several balls of wool, and knit one, pearl one, or however it works. Some of the patterns from the early 1950s that were lying around the house in the 70s had a very famous face on them. You'd come home from watching The Spy Who Loved Me or Moonraker at the pictures and there on the sideboard, modelling knitwear, was a young Roger Moore before he made his millions. He was so well known for doing this way back when that his nickname was The Big Knit. This guy really did have humble beginnings, it's got to be said, born in 1927 to a police officer and his wife who lived in Stockwell, South London. But look at this from the Daily Mirror in 1952. He is one of Britain's leading photographic models, it says. His is the face in most of the romantic pictures in women's magazines, the face behind some of the best shaving lathers. His are the strong teeth, cleaned by the best toothpastes and toothbrushes. Rogers is the torso that sets off bathing trunks on thousands of hoardings. You've heard of page three, girls? Well... Roger was the back-page fella on this occasion. And in the years that follow, you see him cropping up more and more in the press, whether that's appearing in a play as a country bumpkin and being wolf-whistled by a female journalist in the audience, I might add, filming TV roles in New York, being signed to a seven-year contract by MGM, or living in a big, posh, haunted house in England with his wife, the singer Dorothy Squires. Here's the mirror again in 1955, tipping him for stardom alongside Rita Marino, Virginia Leith and Robert Wagner. And sure enough, here he is three years later, heading up the TV series Ivanhoe. From there, he went on to The Saint and James Bond, and you would think with his looks and the stardom and all the money he had, the fame might have gone to his head, but by all accounts, he was a lovely man. Madeline Smith, whose dress he magnetically removed in his first Bond film, Live and Let Die, once told me that. And if you've ever read a flight attendant's discussion board about the nicest and the nastiest celebrities, he comes out of it extremely well, unlike Scylla Black. I've listened to some of his books on audio, and the personality traits that come through strongest are his decency and his self-deprecation. I didn't realise it looking through those knitting patterns in the 1970s, but this was a man who could laugh at himself, and that's a wonderful quality to have. When he died in 2017 at the age of 89, he'd really achieved the status of national treasure, and the comedy writer Mark Haynes wrote a heartwarming and memorable post about him on social media. As a seven-year-old, in about 1983, Mark had seen Roger at Nice Airport in France, and got his granddad to ask for an autograph. The actor signed it Roger Moore, and not James Bond, which disappointed and confused young Mark. So Roger beckoned him over, looked from side to side, and said, in a hushed voice, I have to sign my name as Roger Moore, because otherwise Blofeld might find out I was here. Years later, Mark was working as a scriptwriter, on a recording that involved UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. And this is where he met Moore again, because the star was a UNICEF ambassador. So he repeated this anecdote to the actor, and this prompted a chuckle. And Moore said, well, I don't remember, but I'm glad you got to meet James Bond. 
A little bit later, as they were passing each other in a corridor, Roger paused, looked both ways, raised an eyebrow and said in a hushed voice, Of course I remember our meeting in Nice, but I didn't say anything in there, because those cameramen, any one of them could have been working for Blofeld. I was as delighted at thirty as I had been at seven, Mark remembered. What a man! What a tremendous man!